Uh, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, uh, continuing this sermon series in the book of Ephesians. So you can begin turning to Ephesians chapter 3. If you do not have a Bible, you can reach forward in that pew back in front of you. Uh, grab that Bible there. Turn to page 151 in the New Testament. That's where we will be. And if you do not own a Bible, we would love for you to take that Bible with you as a gift from us because we want everybody reading the Word of God. As you're turning there to, uh, to Ephesians chapter 3, I-, I would like to give one announcement uh, regarding this evening. Um, as many of you have heard, and we've put it in some of our social media, but some of you still have not heard, uh, ne- this evening at school, if-, if you have any of those testimonies of your own that you would be willing to share or be prepared for those this evening. Also, I've encouraged you all, please, please invite people. Uh, and invite, invite teenagers, invite students, invite uh, other adults, invite lost individuals. Look, there's obviously, God is doing something within this world right now. And there is a move that's happening. Now, the ramifications of the move, it, it can't be determined at this moment. One of the things we talk about when we talk about the movements of God is it's the long jet. We've done this on numerous occasions, but it means like, for example, if I am in need of, of peace and mercy, and God dispenses peace and mercy to say to Ron, then that means that God is going to, he's willing to do that for me as well. In fact, he's already done so. It's just about us receiving what the Father has already extended because he's no respecter of person. So if he's willing to save one, he's willing to save another. If he's willing to, uh, to heal one, he's willing to heal another. If he's willing to uh, bring a revival to one, he's willing to bring a revival to another. And so we, we get an opportunity this evening to actually hear one who actually experienced a revival and got called out of the revival movement that took place. And also understand that revival movements aren't just a singular moment. It, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it, was, it was progressive. There were several things that took place along the way that stirred what was going on within our community. And we get a chance to hear that tonight. And so I want to encourage you. Please come back. Please be inviting folks to come back. Uh, again, young people, you know, it, this is one of the, the realities also. If you go back in the United States history and even world history, and you look at every single one of the great awakenings that took place, almost every single one of them started with young people. Almost every single one of them. They also were birthed out of prayer. Prayer and young people birthed all of the great awakenings that we have, that we've ever experienced. And so, quite frankly, young people, we're we're looking to you and saying, grab hold. Grab hold of what the Holy Spirit can do. Kind of, if you will, lead us. Lead us. Because some of the problems with us is that we get so comfortable. We get so content, you know, in in, in, in everything that we're like, well, I've already done that. Well, you know what? Jesus is new every morning His mercies are new every morning. His grace is new every morning. And he is wanting to dispense his grace and his mercy upon us even right now. So I would encourage you, please come back tonight uh, and be a part of that service um, with uh, Roland and and to hear the testimony of what God did during our in our community even here a few years back. So having uh, said those words, I hope you've now made it to Ephesians chapter three as we continue on in this sermon series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I I titled today's message, As Paul Goes, So We All Go. Also, so we we go also. As Paul goes, so we go also. Um, And I I titled that because we're going to look at three different things that were apparent in the life of Paul that are also true of us. Again, I just now was talking about even like the need for revival and healing and peace and all these kind of things. If God is no respecter of person, if God did this for Paul, then this is what God is willing to do for us. And by the way, even as we start to look at some of these, some of us might be sitting there going, but I don't want all of those. But guess what? It's also the reality of what it ought to be for us as believers in Jesus Christ. And so as Paul goes, so we go also. So let's read verses 1 through 7, 1 through 7 of Ephesians chapter 3, and then begin to unpack this. So for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, For the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, 
which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Let's go to the Father for a moment. Father, we are we are a people desperate for you. We we know that if we are born again that we have fellowship with you. Father, for so many of us, our fellowship with you is something that we sometimes take for granted or even just dismiss or or even functionally or practically live our life out as, as functional atheists, even though we may give intellectual head knowledge and, and intellectual assent to the realities of the truths found in the scriptures. Father, there's times in which we don't actually display and live out faith. Father, what we know is that faith is displayed in our actions. It's not in our words. We we need to have words, Father. But But the actions give evidence to the words that we say. If we, if we say that we love you, but then we live as, as, as the heathens and the pagans of the world, then, Father, do we love you? The answer is a resounding no. This is, this is the challenge that the New Testament continually writes about. John says that if we, if we love you, we will obey you. Father Paul lived out the expression of his faith. He, he displayed it for all to see, and there was no doubts whatsoever to the conviction of his trust in you for salvation and life. And as a result, his life displayed your manifest presence in sign, wonders, and power, and in boldness of word and in deed. And Father, we are asking, we are asking, would you, would you stir our hearts? Would you, would you release your Holy Spirit in our midst to, into such a fashion that we can't help but deny the realities that we have met and encountered you, we are not the same any longer. But that we are stirred by your passions. We are stirred by your longings. 
that the things that you desire to bring to pass, that we are joining you alongside in that missional work and saying, God, we know that you are at work and we are joining you in that work and we want you to be exalted in that work. Father, give us the courage and the boldness to join you. Lord, you changed the entire world with just 12 men. You changed the entire world. But Father, what could happen here in Hardy County if just a handful of individuals truly experienced you and said, no matter what, no matter what comes, no matter what happens, I will be steadfast and faithful to you, Lord God. I will be steadfast to you in my business. I will be steadfast to you in my family. I will be steadfast to you in my church. I will be steadfast to you in the marketplace. I will be steadfast to you. All of my allegiance, all of who I am, will be declared and resolutely yours and yours alone. Oh, Father, would you move in our midst? Let us experience that kind of grace and, and power in our presence. And may we each individually, may we be the ones that you stir to that kind of obedience. Oh, Jesus. Oh, glory to you. Adore you who is worthy of praise. Honor you who is worthy of honor. Glory to you, the creator, sustainer, giver of life. You are our all in all. Let your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts even now as we continue to unpack this particular passage. Let us learn these truths of Paul's lives, his life, and, and may we then follow that example and pursue steadfast and hard after you. Oh Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, your very first point is this. It's, this is the part, maybe we don't want this one. Maybe we don't want this one, but it is also a reality. And that is that we need to expect persecution. Expect persecution. Why do I say that? Look with me at verse 1 of this third chapter. It says there, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Paul is in prison for the sake of the gospel. That is why he is in prison. This is a persecution. And this is not like prison systems of the day. You know, there, there, there is no uh, rec yard for him to go play basketball and to run around in. You know, the, the, he, is, he is chained, as we know from other passages of Scripture, he is literally chained between Roman soldiers that are in, in, in a four-hour cycle with him. This is the life he is now experiencing. This is the life he is now living. Now, by God's grace, God has permitted that he be allowed to write letters. And that is why we predominantly have most of the New Testament. It's because he wrote most of the New Testament while in prison. And so we are grateful for this reality that God utilized, even in his prison sentences, a methodology and a way for us this day to be blessed and to experience what God wants us to know about him and his character. But every bit of this starts off with an aspect of persecution. And, and all we have to do is, is go back to, to like Corinthians. Um, and, and, and we get to experience and see uh, some of the stuff that Paul um, actually starts to describe regarding his, his moments uh, and, and his life. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find it there very quickly. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't have this plan. This was, this was, this was un, un, unthought of, but I figured, hey, let, let, me, let me kind of share it with you. If you all find it first, give it to me. I'm looking for the passage in Corinthians where Paul describes his, his, um, um, his afflictions. Uh, there it is. Behold, this is chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I, I am just as bold myself. Are, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. 
I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. How are you all doing on that one, by the way, just out of curiosity? Beaten on times without number. In other words, I've been beaten so many times, I've lost count. Okay? How many of you, any, anyone, any, anyone, any, any, okay, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Five times he received 39 lashes. Whoa. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weaknesses. Notice that's what he described. All that persecution, he described as his weaknesses. Those persecutions, he describes as his weaknesses. Why? Because the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. And then he continues to go on. Beloved. Paul, in another location, actually says, uh, anyone who wants to serve Christ will be persecuted. That's actually what he says. And I realize that we do live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and so therefore our persecution is minimal. It's also because of that that is the reason why we have the American doctrines toward ten times, in my personal opinion. The adversary wants us to believe that persecution cannot come to us. Beloved, Persecution can come to us. And in fact, it's in the moments of persecution that the church actually thrives. It's in the moments when we who are truly of the body of Christ recognize what is in front of us and because everyone else disperses, the true remnant remains. My fear is what does the church really look like? If persecution truly came to us here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, who would actually really survive? It is something we need to be praying that the strength and the provision of the Holy Spirit would be upon us. That we would endure hardships as good soldiers in the kingdom of God. And be steadfast. And only by God's grace would we be able to endure such a thing. But Paul, he says, I, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. In other words, the reason Paul was willing to go through whatever it is that he went through was because he knew there was something greater at stake. And by the way, beloved, this is part of the reason why I really question what we as the early, as as the church, especially the church of the United States, if how many of us really are truly born again. Because most of us won't even share the gospel with our neighbor because we're afraid of what they might think towards us. Most of us won't do the things necessary and make the sacrifices necessary in our lives just to identify with Christ. Because we're, we're concerned what it's going to do to us economically. We're concerned about what it's going to do to us socially. We care more about the opinions of other people than we do the opinion of the Christ. And this is not the methodology that Paul looked at. Paul said, I want Christ and to know him. Nothing else. I want him. And that needs to be the heartbeat of us. So as Paul goes, so we go also. May we understand that we need to expect persecution. And, and then that leads into this next part. He already, he's already indicated it. He's already alluded to it in that first verse. But you also need to embrace ministry. You need to embrace ministry. So you're expecting persecution. And the reason you're expecting persecution is because... You embraced ministry. This ought to be the natural byproduct of us as followers of Jesus Christ. 
If we declare we are his, then our, our, Paul describes himself as a, as a bond servant. We are bond servants of Christ Jesus. And as a bond servant, you could also use the word slave. You are a slave of Christ. What rights do you have as a slave? You have no rights as a slave. Your job is to say, yes, master, your will be done. Now, praise the Lord Jesus. Our master also says, I call you friends. But he still says, I'm Lord. So why do I say that? We see it here in verse 2, and then we, he reiterates it actually in verse 7. So, so let, me, let me read verse 2, let me read verse 7 and then, together, and then we'll kind of pick these things up. He says, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. So he's talking about this stewardship that God has given to him, and who the stewardship was given him for was, was for them, these these Gentiles. Then you, then you jump down to verse 7. He says, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. So he's referencing this again. Earlier he said the stewardship of God's grace. Now he calls it the gift of God's grace was given to, uh, was, was given, um, to me according to the working of his power. So what Paul is describing here is he says, look, he says it's a stewardship of God's power. And, and he says it's by the means dispensed by grace. And you've heard me describe this before. Sometimes we misunderstand the word grace. We sometimes equate grace with mercy. Mercy is what you, what you receive that you don't deserve. That's what mercy is. In other words, every single one of us deserve the lake of fire. But God says that whosoever will call in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And we will be transferred from, from death unto life. We will be given a new heart. We will be given new life. We will be born again. We will be new creations. And so even though we deserved the lake of fire, because of God's mercy, we receive eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's mercy. Grace also, it's, it's it, it, the acronym that, that Junior loves to throw out, and I love it, is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches. So in other words, grace is this power word. In other words, after you've received mercy, God says, now I'm going to dispense to you grace so that you might be able to endure through it, have the power to walk in it, to experience the fullness of God. E even back there, even that Corinthians passage, considering we're, we're, we're playing this jump around that wasn't in my, in my sermon notes, in that 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, after he gets done reading, remember I told you he's talking about all of his weaknesses. He said, if I boast, I will boast all, uh, all uh, of what pertains to my weaknesses. When you jump to verse, uh, or chapter 12, Paul then begins to talk there about his desire where he's asking God to remove a thorn in his flesh, okay? And he says this, he says there in verse, starting in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Which, by the way, that's going to be also in this sermon that we're talking about, these revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heavens. He's talking about himself. And I... Know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. So he's again referencing his weaknesses, which he's already told us in the preceding chapter, that his weaknesses are all these persecutions. And so he continues on. He says, for I, I will do, uh, for, for if I do wish to boast, I will not be, uh, excuse me, if for, for if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. And here's where it comes in. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So who is it that was given to him? A messenger of Satan. And what was the messenger of Satan doing to him? Tormenting him. And how was he tormenting him? In persecution. You were never 
told that you'd be spared persecution. Now, I've already said, if anyone wants to be in Christ or godly, he will be persecuted. He's saying, you're going to be persecuted. And who is the one that does the persecution? Our adversary, a messenger of Satan, was, in, was, was tormenting me to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning that, I implore the Lord three times that, I might leave, uh, that, that it might leave me. And he said to me, and here's where it comes in, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I will contend with weakness, with insults, and with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am persecuted, then I am strong. And why am I strong in the midst of the persecution? Because God dispenses his grace. It is a power word. God is saying when grace is given to you, you have the strength, you have the power, you have the might to be able to endure through it and to bring glory to God. And this is what he is describing. And so he's saying, I have been given this stewardship of God's power, of his grace And why, again, he even emphasizes, why was he given this grace, this stewardship? For them. For them. That is why he was given this grace. Was so that these lost individuals, these Gentiles, might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason you go through persecutions in your life is so that you will have a testimony to share with a lost world. That you can go to them and say, look, I understand. But there's one who is greater who lives within me. And he doesn't promise. Paul just goes, I already went through that litany in in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He goes through the litany of all the troubles. But he says, it's all worth it. I'll boast in these weaknesses even though I talk like a madman. Even though I talk like a foolish individual. I'll boast on these things because it's giving me opportunity to declare Christ and Christ alone, to lift up Christ and Christ alone, to exalt Christ and Christ alone. This is all that he desires to do. In fact, you start to look at Paul's litany. I mean, he's, he is, he's this Hebrew of Hebrews. He was taught by Gamaliel. He's got all of the right credentials. And yet he says, I consider all of that as dung, as rubbish, as, as, as manure nothingness compared to knowing Christ and him alone do we long for Christ like that do we long to join him in his ministry so that we can be used for the sharing of the gospel Paul embraced his ministry are we are we first Baptist Church of Bowling Green are we raising up another generation of ministers in the gospel. Yes, we have some. Obviously, we've already mentioned Roland even just a few moments ago. Roland was a member of our church and he came out of this church. Sharon Rivers came out of this church. And there are others, I'm just naming two. There are others. But, But who, what young people do we have in our midst right now that the Lord God is stirring on their hearts and saying that is going to be a minister of the gospel. Are we, are we even praying for God to raise up men and women to enter into the service for his glory? We need to embrace ministry. And we need to serve presently in our environment. Wherever we go, whatever we do. Look, even in the announcement video, Carson talked about the, the Easter egg hunt. We're partnering with Bayside over here. It's just in a few weeks, y'all. But when I go, when I went back there, I looked back and I went out there and I looked at the sign up sheet, and there's very few names. We, 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 are you telling me we really we cannot give a little bit of time from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
Maybe if you're going to hide eggs, maybe come actually a little bit earlier because there's some time sheets out there on when to be there for the, the hiding the eggs. You're saying, you're, you're, are, we, are we really saying, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I can't even sacrifice an hour to go to an environment where there's going to be over a thousand people and most of them or many of them are going to be unchurched individuals. And I'm not willing to have conversations with them. I'm not willing to wear a, an orange shirt that says, how can I serve you and minister to them? Really? Well, that's not real hard ministry. That's like the easy one. That's the easy one. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you. Embrace ministry. Paul grabbed it all. Paul said, I will do it all. I will become all things to all people that I might win some for the gospel. That was Paul's attitude. What is your attitude? What is your attitude? And that leads us to the last one. We expect persecution. We embrace ministry. And we experience revelation. We experience revelation. You, you'll remember even, and not even coming to this Ephesians passage, you'll remember this as just a moment ago when we were in that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the whole reason why the thorn the messenger of Satan that came to torment him was given was because he was taken up into the third heaven. He says, I will go on, this was, it was in verse 1 of chapter 12, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. And then back in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. You know, for most of us, we sit there and go, God, if it means persecution, I don't really want the revelation. Paul said, I want more. I want more. You, you, you look at Moses. After Moses had seen all the, 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 the plagues dispensed upon the, Israel, uh, the Egyptians, after, after Moses saw the, the Red Sea parted and the entire Egyptian army destroyed, after, after Moses um, saw uh, the, the, the fire coming down uh, onto the mountain and all these things, after all of this, God says, what, what would you have? And he says, I want to see your glory. Had he not already seen his glory? Had, had his face not already shown and radiated the presence of God? And what does Moses want? I want more. I want more. I want more. Beloved, this ought to again be our heartbeat. It was the heartbeat of Paul. As Paul goes, so we go also. Paul wanted to experience the revelations of God. We see it here in verses 3 through 6. That by revelation, I was persecuted. I, I embraced ministry. That by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. And he's going to keep talking about this mystery. The mystery that is this revelation. He's going to talk about that. But he's going to also tell us what it is. As I wrote before in brief, and obviously we've seen many of Paul's writings in other locations and these, these letters that would be circulated around. And so he said, I've already talked a little bit about this already. By, by referring to this, by referring to this revelation, by referring to this, this mystery, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he's saying, hey, when you read those other letters, you're going to understand this particular mystery that I'm talking about even right now. And he goes on. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. And then he says, let's be specific about it. To be specific, 
that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he goes on, he's describing all these things, this mystery of Christ, this mystery of Christ, this mystery of Christ. Love, we've talked about this at numerous lengths. You've got to understand from an Israelite, from a Jewish perspective, we were the anathema. We, we were the ones that, that, that again, in, in, in their prejudice, in their misunderstanding of things, in, in their wrong assumptions and understanding even of bloodline, they were the ones who would intentionally try to go around the Samaritans. It, it, there was a direct route right through Samaria to go from one end to the other, but they said, no, no, we're going to go around it because we don't even want to be tainted by it. What does Jesus do? He goes right on in and meets a woman at the well. And it's the first time in the gospel that it says that he is the savior of the woman. To the, to, to the Samaritans? Savior of the world? To these half-breeds? Well, we're not even half-breeds. We're just full-blown Gentiles. You remember another time Jesus interacted with a Gentile, don't you? This woman has a, has a daughter who's sickly. And she comes and she asks Jesus to heal the daughter. And Jesus, being a good Jew, doesn't even talk to her. He ignores her. He treats her like the outsider that she is. She, however, is so persistent that the disciples say, Jesus, would you do something? Get rid of her. You know? And Jesus says, it is not right to give the children's food to the dogs. To the dogs. And yeah, there are different words in, in Greek for dogs. And yes, this is the one for like the household dog. Okay? At the end of the day, it's still a dog. He called her a dog. Because that's what Gentiles were. And yet, what does this dog do? This dog says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus was astonished. It's the two places he was astonished, and both of them were by Gentiles, the centurion and this woman, and he was astonished at her faith. It says, woman, according to your faith, your daughter is healed. Go. In that hour, her daughter was healed. Jesus came for us all. And that is the mystery of the gospel. Is he came for us Gentiles. He came for the Jews. He came for all of his creation. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. He came. He shed his blood. He died to reconcile humanity to himself. And to pay the wrath that God rightly desired over sin. And so he is the mystery. And this mystery was not understood in the Old Testament. That's why he's describing it. He says, those in the Old Testament, they couldn't grasp it. Even though as we, as we go back and we read the Old Testament, we can clearly see that God's intent was always for the Gentiles. They did not. It was a mystery to them. A mystery just means something that's not revealed. That's all that mystery means. It's, it's, it's not revealed. It's not been opened. But as soon as the mystery is solved, as soon as the mystery is opened, Everybody understand it. You, you, you all have watched mystery movies. You've played mystery games. You've wa played Clue. As soon as you open up the evidence card, you, the, there's no more mystery. It's been revealed. It's been made known. And, and, and as you watch those or read those or play those games, when all of a sudden the reality of the, of how, the how it's done, when you get the final scene and, and, and the detective explains it, you're kind of like, oh, how did I miss that? It was clearly in front of me. How did I miss that? Because it was a mystery before, but once it's made known, it's evident. 
And it is evident to us that Jesus came for the entire world, for the Gentiles included. Jesus died for all. That is the mystery. And that's what he, he even defines what the mystery is. That's what verse 6 was all about. So to be specific, to make the mystery clear that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. And, and in this part, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Beloved, I'm telling you, this is what I've been trying to, I, this entire book of Ephesians that we've been trying to drill, drill home. You have access to the promises of God. Every aspect of it. The very last song that we sang was talking about, you know, in the fire, in the fire. And in that song, it talks about how the, how the spirit of God is in us. And that we have the power, the, the same power that raised Christ is in us. The same power that raised Christ is in us. And we know that perfect love casts out fear, and yet we walk around in fear and timidity and worry and doubt. And God is sitting there saying, why? Why, do you not understand that you have received my promise? You've received my power? You've received my grace? You've received my riches? Do you not understand that the Holy Spirit dwells within you? Do you not understand my son, Christ Jesus, dwells within you? He changed you? Loved. Let us be bold. As goes, as Paul goes, so we go also. Let us not be afraid of persecution. Let us embrace ministry. And let us long to experience the revelation of more and more and more of who God is. He wants to reveal more of his character to us. He longs for us to know him in more profound and more intimate ways. And if he's done it, if he's done it for one, he is willing to do it for another because he is no respecter of persons. And he wants to dispense his revelation of his glory to you. All you have to do is receive it. If you've never encountered Christ, then we have this time of invitation where you can come down and you can say, look, I need to know Jesus. But maybe, maybe you are already his and you're sitting there saying, Scott, I'm feeling a tug towards ministry. And I need to, I need to publicly acknowledge and declare before this, this audience, God is calling me to ministry. Maybe, maybe you're, needing to, you're hungering for more of the revelation of God. I would invite you to come to these steps that we call altars and just cry out to God and say, God, I, I want more of you. I want to experience the fullness of your revelation. I, I want to know more of you. Would you come and cry out to God? Say, give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Father, we invite you. You're already here. You're already here. But we're asking for your spirit to manifest himself in our midst. We're asking for your Holy Spirit to make himself so known beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are stirring and moving in our midst. Oh, Father, would our hearts be receptive to you? Move, Lord Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name.